I had some whistling noises. Right, hello, today I'm talking about spiders. You can identify and record during lockdown. So these are some really easy to identify species. Oh, I just unplugged my laptop, sorry. I think it should be okay for now. Um, yeah, so really easy to identify species um, that you can spot around your homes and gardens. Oh, my PowerPoint's frozen. There we go. Okay, so first, for those of you that don't know, it's just a very brief overview of spider anatomy because I might mention some of these terms as I go through. So I'm hoping you can all see my mouse pointer here. So the spider's bodies are divided into two segments. Uh, so there's the cephalothorax, which is their head and thorax combined, and then there's their abdomen. On the cephalothorax, they've got four pairs of legs. Um, so they don't have any wings or antennae because they're not insects. Then at the front of the cephalothorax, oh, I'm getting tongue tied with that one, they've got six to eight simple eyes. So with spiders, most of them can only detect light and its absence, and they don't have that great uh, sight. Some of them do, and I'll mention one of those after. Um, and something else I'll talk about as well are these appendages here, which are the pedipalps and the chelicerae, which are their jaws. Oh, gone too quick, sorry. All right, so spiders in the UK, so they're found in every terrestrial habitat from the seashore to the mountain tops. They're uh, really important to our ecosystems because they basically provide us with free pest control. There's over 670 species at the moment in the UK, um, but over half of these are the tiny, tiny money spider species. Um, so they're obviously quite hard to identify. And spiders in general are quite hard to identify. A lot of them require a microscopic examination, but the ones I'm going to talk to you today are distinctive species, so we don't need to get into that. Okay, so one thing to look out for, first of all, when you spot a spider, is if they have these boxing gloves or not. So you can see them circled here. So these are the pedipalps, which I was talking about before. And the males, when they're mature, have swollen pedipalps, which is why they look like little boxing gloves on the end there. Um, so yeah, that's quite an easy thing to spot to start with, you know, if you've got a male. However, if they don't have swollen palps, it doesn't necessarily mean it's female. It could be an immature male. Um, and then something else to mention. So these pedipalps are really complex structures. And that's what the males use to transfer the sperm to the females. So the females have an epigyne, and this here is the epigyne. It's on the underside of their abdomen. So this is for mature females now. And then the palp and the epigyne work like a sort of lock and key combo um, for each species. They're different for each species and you can use those to identify each species when you're looking at them with a microscope. But again, I'm trying not to get too technical with that stuff today. Okay, so the spiders I'm going to talk to you about now are distinctive species and they're all part of the BAS, which is the British Arachnological Society. They're spider recording schemes. They've got, I think there's 12 spiders on there altogether. I'm just going to talk about some of the ones uh, you can find around you at the moment. Um, and they basically will accept records for these species just using photos and you don't need to send specimens or anything. Okay, so first of all, we're going to look at orb weaving spiders. Um, so the orb weavers are a family of spiders. I think there's 37 spider families in the UK. So orb weaving spiders are one of these families. And then within this family there's 32 species. So general family characteristics. They have these almost spherical abdomens, which you can see here. Um, however, males generally are a bit smaller and I'll show you some photos of that in a bit um, just so you can compare that. So yeah, these spherical abdomens and they generally have uh, sorry, stout and spiny legs. Um, they're usually found on their webs and they're quite clumsy walkers when away from their webs. So their webs are these classic orb webs, which I tend to think of when I think of spiders, these big sort of circular shaped webs. Um, so one thing to note is that even though all spiders can produce silk, not all of the families can produce webs. So if you see a spider on a web, that sort of instantly narrows it down to it being a spider that makes a web. And then if you look at the shape of the web, obviously like this one, it narrows it down to being um, one of the orb weaving families. So there are another uh, family that make these sorts of webs, but we're not going to go into those today because they're quite tricky to identify. 
Okay, so the first one, and I'm sure all of you have seen this one before, uh, it's the garden cross spider. So again, it's an orb weaver. You can see it on its orb web in the garden, and they generally build these webs wherever the vegetation or your garden, uh, that's not a word, or your garden furniture can support an orb web. So the distinctive thing about these is this white cross pattern, hence the garden cross spider name. And then they've got these stripy legs as well. Now the colours of these spiders, they're not always brown. They can be sort of yellow or quite a dark colour as well, but then they've always got this cross pattern. And I'm sure you've seen these before, but they can be quite large as well. So four to 18 millimetres in body length. And when I talk about body length, I'm talking about the tip of the abdomen here to the top of the cephalothorax there to where the eyes are. Um, yeah, so they always have this cross pattern, but as you can see here, there's a few different colour forms. This one here in the middle is a male. So as I was saying before, males are generally a bit smaller, their abdomens are a bit smaller, but you can still see that cross pattern there. And then this one on the side is a bit of an odd one. I haven't actually seen one like this before, but it really throws me when I see pictures of it. So you can still sort of see that cross pattern, but it's all sort of merged into one on this one. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to point out that they don't always have this perfect cross pattern, but you can sort of make it out there. So another orb weaving spider I'm going to talk about, which is quite similar, is the four spotted orb web spider. So like the last one had that distinctive cross pattern, this one has a distinctive pattern with these four spots here on the abdomen. So these are found in sort of similar habitats, really undisturbed vegetation, generally, although I've seen one in the house living quite happily as well. Um, so yeah, again, they've got these annulated, which means stripy legs. And again, the colours can vary quite significantly in these ones, and I'll show you some more photos now. And these can get quite large too, so six to 20 millimetres in body length. Now, the females of these spiders, when they're gravid, which essentially means when they're sort of ready to lay eggs, are the heaviest spider we have in the UK. So they get really big, really swollen abdomens, they're quite chunky. So you can spot those quite easily. Okay, yeah, so here are some of the different colour variations here. But again, if you see those four spots, you know you've got a four spotted orb web. So that's another good one to identify. Okay, I'm going to move on and we've got another orb web here. So this one has a couple of names. It's known as the toad spider or the walnut orb web spider. Um, this one's actually a nocturnal species. So if you go out into your garden at night with a torch, you might be able to spot these. They're found in a wide range of habitats and definitely I think you've probably in your garden especially in around the fences and any gates and stuff because they squeeze themselves into cracks and crevices during the day um, and because they like to squeeze themselves into these small spaces they've got this flattened body shape which is quite distinctive for this species and overall as well they've got this general sort of mottled leathery almost appearance and something else to help you identify these ones along with a flattened body they have these four pairs of dimples on the abdomen there it's quite hard to see them in these photos i couldn't find a good photo to show it off properly but when you see them you can see the dimples quite clearly um yeah and again quite a big spider from 8 to 14 millimeters in body length so this one we're not so likely to see it in your gardens, uh, but I wanted to mention it anyway because it's a really cool spider. So it's more common in the southeast, um, but you do find it elsewhere. There are records elsewhere, but you can spot it if you're on out on your daily outing for fresh air, maybe along road verges and sort of in quite long unmanaged grassland. But I just wanted to mention them because the females have these amazing wasp patterns on the abdomen, hence their name, which is the wasp spider. So it's only the females that have got this really distinctive pattern. I'll show you a picture of the males now. They're much harder to identify. Um, so in terms of submitting records, you can't do that for the males without sort of taking a closer look at them. But you can for the females. So yeah, look out for these yellow and black stripy spiders. Uh, these again are still orb weaving spiders. They uh, spin orb webs, but quite close to the ground. 
And something else uh, to look out for with these spiders is the stabilimentum. I always get really tongue tied saying that, sorry, <laughs> which is basically this zigzag pattern which goes through the web. And I'll show a better picture of that now. Um, and yeah, these spiders feed mainly on grasshoppers and crickets, so unlikely in small gardens, but I just thought it would be a cool one to point out. So there we go, here's a picture. So this is the female here, and you can see that great pattern on the back there. And that's a male, so yeah, you can see from there they don't have that distinctive pattern, so they're much harder to identify. And then again, this is what I was telling you to look out for on their webs. They've got this zigzag that runs through their webs. Um, they're not quite sure what the purpose of this is yet, I don't think. Um, it's thought it helps them catch sort of larger prey species, but I don't think they quite know why or how. But yeah, something else to look out for. So I'm going to move on to another family now. So this family it doesn't build webs. These are the crab spiders. So there are 27 species of crab spiders in the uh, UK. And as the name suggests, they've got a sort of crab-like body shape. So they're quite squat and stumpy, um, but they've got these two longer forward-facing legs, which I'm hoping you can see there. So they generally sort of look a bit crab-like. They can walk sideways as well, like crabs, um, and they're quite slow moving. And as I mentioned, they don't make webs. These spiders generally use sort of camouflage and stealth to catch their prey. And I'll show you what I mean by that now. So a distinctive crab spider species is the flower crab spider, which is also known as the golden rod crab spider. So these guys, as you can see in the pictures here, basically just sit and wait on flowers for their prey to come to them. So I'd say most of you, if you've got some nice patches of flowers in the garden, you should be able to spot some of these. They're quite common in gardens and grasslands, sort of woodland edge habitats. So when you're trying to identify them, if you look at their cephalothorax here, they've got these olive green bands down the side, which I'm hoping you can see. Um, and then one thing to note as well is these spiders can change colour, which is really cool. So as you can see, there's yellow and white here. They um, have some yellow pigment, I think, in there, in some form of glands that they can secrete to make them yellow or I guess retract it again to make them white, depending on the colour of the flower they're on. But that doesn't mean they're necessarily always on yellow or white flowers. I've seen them on pink flowers a number of times and they just, yeah, still just sit and wait for pollinators or other insects to come along and they'll grab them from there. So they're a good one to look out for. And again, quite big, so nine to 11 meters in body length. And this is another one where these are both females and they're quite distinctive. The male is not so distinctive, so we can't identify that one just with a photo. Um, but you'll be able to see the sort of crab-like legs as well with any crab spiders. So I'm going to move on to another family now. So these are the jumping spiders. We've got 38 species of these all together in the UK. So the family characteristics, they've generally got quite small compact bodies and then they've got these eyes as well, these massive eyes at the front which are, um, help you to work out if it's a jumping spider or not. So as the name suggests, they jump on their prey um, to get them. Uh, so these large eyes help them to judge distance when they're jumping onto their prey. The spiders as well are very alert. They've got good eyesight, obviously, because these large eyes. Um, and if you go near them, they sort of follow your fingers around as well. They really like, look up and look at you and follow you around. And generally you can find them in sort of low vegetation or on walls and garden fences. So one distinctive species that we have that you should be able to spot in your gardens, um, particularly on walls and fences in sunny spots, you can see them running around, are uh, the zebra jumping spider. So as the name suggests, they have these stripes on their body, uh, which help you identify them. These, uh, yeah, so sort of darker and lighter stripes there. And then the males have got these really large jaws which they can hang their pelts over. So if you just stop and look at a garden wall or a fence for a while, you're gonna be able to spot these hopefully. And I'll show you some more photos now. That can show you the male there that hangs its pelts over its massive jaws. And then I'm hoping that one just gives you an idea of the size of them as well. They're quite small spiders, uh, but very fast. 
So another family I'm going to talk about are the nursery web and rat spiders. So there's only three species in this family. They're quite large spiders, so 10 to 20 mil in body length, and they're generally sort of brown, and then they've got these stripes along, oh, hang on, I'm not using my mouse there. They've got these stripes along their bodies. Um, so two of the species in this family are actually rat spiders, and they live in wetland habitats, but one of them's quite rare, and the other's got quite a scattered distribution, so I'm not gonna talk about them too much, but this top photo here is a rat spider. And these ones can actually run on the top of water, um, and they can also submerge themselves as well if there's any predators around. So I'd suggest Googling those after because they're quite interesting spiders. Um, but yeah, quite hard to separate the two species. So I'm not going to talk about those today. But one you should be able to find in your garden or parks nearby are the nursery web spiders. So this is the other species within that family. So there's a couple more pictures of them there. So you generally find these spiders in long vegetation. Um, and you can often spot them sunbathing on leaves. So in this top photo there, it shows you how they rest in this really distinctive position with their two pairs of front legs held together. And you can sort of see it in that bottom photo there as well. So as their name suggests, nursery web, they build a nursery web for their spiderlings. So you can see in this bottom photo here, if you look out um, mainly more between sort of May and September time, they'll build these webs and just look out for folded vegetation and then you can see in the middle there's the spiderlings there um, and then the mother will usually be nearby guarding them. So when identifying this as well as this distinctive resting shape to look out for uh, it's also good to look for these wavy edges down the side and I'll show you some more pictures of them now to tell you uh, to show you what I mean. So yeah generally brown in colour but a few different variations here but you can see these waves that run down the side of their abdomens and cephalothorax and then again this distinctive resting position and probably might be a bit early at the moment but definitely may time may june you can see them carrying or the females carrying around their egg sacs as well so these just sort of look like golf balls and they'll carry them around until they're then ready to make these nursery webs and then the spiderlings hatch within there So as I mentioned, these uh, species are all part of the BAS spider recording scheme. So if you do spot any of them, take a photo and you can submit records. So this is the spider recording scheme website there. Um, so all you have to do is take a photo, note the date, location and the habitat you saw it in. And then you can upload your records onto the site there and they're collating all of those records. Something else I was going to talk about now is the BAS have just started a new uh, survey for spiders. So this is the Cellar Spider Survey. So they've started this now um, because everyone's indoors. So I'm going to just show you some of the spiders that they're looking for. Um, I'll come back to this slide in a bit. So don't worry about looking at any of the ID features here. So the Cellar Spiders are another family of spiders that we have in the UK. There's three species in this family. There's the daddy long leg spider, the wine cellar spider, and the marbled salad spider. And they're all very sort of, I would say, delicate and flimsy looking in appearance. Um, they've got these really long legs, quite small bodies, but these spiders can actually take down the bigger house spiders that you see running around your floors. Um, so they're, yeah, they're quite good at catching much larger prey. Oh, I didn't mean to go. There, yeah. Um, yeah, and as their name suggests, cellar spiders, uh, they're usually found indoors or in cellars or caves or sort of cupboards as well. They seem to like the cupboards in my house. Here we go. So the first species within this family I want to talk about is the daddy long leg spider. So these are the ones you generally see in the corners of rooms and windows and they sort of hang upside down in their tangled webs. So they're quite pale, gray, sort of yellowy color. Um, but oh, it's not the best picture, I should have zoomed in on this. You can see on their cephalothorax there, they have this central dark marking. Um, so that can help you identify these ones. And then, so a lot of people get confused with these spiders because they're called daddy long leg spiders and lots of people seem to call different things daddy long legs. So I thought it's worth, mentioning the other things I know of called daddy long legs. Um, so I grew up knowing crane flies as daddy long legs, 
Um, obviously, if you do see these, you can tell it's not a spider because they've got wings, they've got three body parts as well. But something else people often get confused with is the daddy long leg spider with harvestmen. Now, harvestmen are arachnids also, um, but the way you can tell these apart, they've also got long legs. But if you look here, they've got this fused body part. Um, so that's characteristic of harvestmen. And then you can see the daddy long leg spider, two body parts there. So the BAS Cellar Spider Survey, they've started this in response to COVID-19 because they know everyone's inside now looking for things to do. So they want to find out uh, this and start mapping the distribution of these different cellar spider species um, across the UK because they don't really know too much about them at the moment. So this is the spider I've just talked about, which is the daddy long leg spider. Also another one which is not quite so common they're looking at the wine cellar spider. So this one, when comparing it to the daddy long leg spider, similar in sort of body shape and appearance, but you can see their abdomen there is sort of smaller, more rounded and blue sort of gray color. And then there's also the marbled cellar spider, which is quite rare, which does look quite similar to the daddy long leg spider. However, it's got these really distinctive patterns on the abdomen there. So they're asking everyone to sort of take a closer look at the cellar spiders in their house to work out which ones are where. Um, and they're already getting lots of new records for the wine cellar spider and the marbled cellar spider um, in new places. So I don't expect you to read this all. Um, we can send this around after, or you can watch it after. Um, but what they're asking you to do for this cellar spider survey is to pick a room in your house or maybe an outhouse or a shed ideally somewhere where you've spotted these cellar spiders before and they want you to count the spiders even if there's none there um, if you do see any obviously take some photos as well but they're quite interested in finding out if they have particular preferences if it's a heated room if there's a certain angle that they build their webs at um, so they ask for a few different bits of information there so what's really handy with this as well they, you can just send them a picture on Twitter, so it's at BAS Surveys, or you can send them an email, um, which is yes, survey at britishspiders.org.uk. And that, yeah, so I said, they've already had lots of new records for these spiders, so it's quite a good one to get involved with and quite interesting to see how they're spreading around the country. Oh, and these are just some uh, examples of some submissions that I had so far so people just yeah you can just send a photo on twitter or email them and that's all you have to do for that survey okay so i'm going to talk now about some other common spiders that you can find around your homes but they're not as distinctive as the other ones so you can't record them but you're probably going to come across them so the first uh, group i'm going to talk about are the lace wheeling spiders so you're all bound to have these sort of crisscrossy webs, uh, which are called lace webs, on fences and sheds and generally on the outside of walls as well. So these are made by the lace weaving spiders. Um, yes, they have these crisscross webs around a sort of central retreat there where the spider uh, waits for its prey. Um, so yeah, you, they're quite dark spiders. Um, you, bound to have seen them already um quite velvety looking in appearance quite hairy um but just to note that there are three species of these that are all quite similar so you can't identify these without looking at them under a microscope and it's not working there we go um yes this is just showing you some more of the lace weaver spiders that you're bound to see around your houses so again, they're quite dark. Um, they generally have sort of lighter mottled abdomens, but from these photos alone, you can't identify which species of lace weaver it is. So then there's also the house spiders. And again, I'm pretty sure you've all seen these. They're the ones that like to get stuck in your bath usually, or run around all over the living room. Uh, particularly in September, sort of autumn time, the male's more active than when they're on the lookout for females. They sort of run out into the middle of the room and then get startled and run away again. Um, yes, they're quite brown, sort of light brown spiders, um, but there's actually three identical species and they're really hard to uh, separate. So again, you can't uh, identify what species just by looking at them. You'd have to take a closer look under a microscope. Um, 
these ones as well make quite similar webs to the lace webs I was just talking about. However, the house spiders generally make more of a called a sheet web, so it's much thicker as you can see here. And the, their retreats as well gen, uh, tend to be in the corner rather than in the middle of the web. So you might spot those. So something else to look out for are the missing sector orb weavers. So I was talking about the orb weavers before, they make these classic sort of circular shaped webs. But if you ever see one of these webs that has a section missing, it's not just because the spider couldn't be bothered to finish it off. It's because there's actually three species of missing sector orb weavers that do this on purpose. Um, so this section here, this line going out, that's their signal line. And then the spiders tend to wait up the top here. And then they'll sort of zoom in across there if anything flies into the web and then catch them really quickly. Um, so yeah, I tend to see these webs they seem to be on the outside of windows quite a lot and on fences as well. Um, yeah, just something else to be aware of because you'll probably have those around. And then another species, these are also all weaving spiders, the cucumber spiders. So as the name suggests, they are nice and green. I'd say they're more, they should be maybe apple spiders though, rather than cucumber. They've sort of got these nice apple green spherical abdomens. Um, so yeah, I find these in the garden as well and then generally in woodland and woodland edge sort of habitats and hedgerows. They build their orb webs generally within sort of trees and shrubs. You'll be able to see them there. Um, and they're all this lovely bright green colour, but there are five species in total. Two of them are quite common, but again, really hard to tell apart just by looking at them. But you're bound to see them, so do you keep an eye out for those? Then something else I thought was worth mentioning because everyone's always a bit scared of these ones. Um, they're the false widow spiders. So there's three species in the UK and again it's really hard to separate them just by looking at them. Um, but I think they're really cool spiders. They are quite often mistaken for being orb weavers which you can see because they have spherical abdomens also. Um, but these belong to the therids which is a different family. So characteristic of that family, they generally have more rounder sort of globular shaped uh, abdomens rather than spherical. Um, but I'm not sure if you can see here, they're quite shiny overall in appearance and rather than having those stout and spiny legs like all weavers, they've got these quite long, thinner, glossier legs. Um, and they don't make all webs either, they make quite sort of just tangled, messy looking almost webs. Um, and yeah, they're all quite dark brown to sort of black in appearance. And then they've got these mottled ab abdomens as well. Something on the back of that, that I should mention is that spiders don't want to hurt you. Um, even though all spiders have got jaws, obviously, um, they contain small amounts of venom, but this is usually just enough to subdue their prey. Spiders will bite if they feel threatened, but I pick up spiders quite often and I haven't been bitten. Um, I know a few people have, if you pick them up and sort of close your hands over the top of them, they feel threatened, then they'll give you a nip. But there's actually only a few species in the UK that have a bite powerful enough to penetrate human skin. And then their venom is in, is in such small quantities that it doesn't really cause any serious harm. Um, a lot of the time you see scare stories in the media and they say spiders from hell are invading and all that stuff. Um, and when you see those horrible spider bites in the paper they're normally secondary infections um, that come around from not keeping the wound clean so it's not as if the spider has made some nasty bite mark on people it's generally um, the aftercare part which is the problem for them but yeah don't be worried they're not out to get you um, they don't want to hurt you and I think that brings me to the end of my presentation so I am going to close this now if it works Yep, there we go. Thank you very much, Holly. That was brilliant. Um, right, we've not had, I've not had any questions sent to me in the chat. Charles or Andy, have you had any, has anybody asked any questions about the presentation in the chat? No. 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 Sorry, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> Okay, right. Well, then does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? There is, oh, there is a there is one. Is it at the bottom? I have a different view to you guys. 
Yeah, uh, Rachel's asking what ID book would you recommend for, for a beginner? Oh, um, okay. so uh, Wild Guide to Spiders, I think, of British Spiders is a really good book um, by um, Lawrence B and some of the other BAS committee. Um, it's got loads of really good pictures in there um, and it tells you what sort of habitat, what time of year to find them, um, pictures of webs and all sorts as well. So yes, yeah, the Wild Guide to Britain Spiders. Okay for that one. Um, one thing that's really good about it is on each of, for each spider that it lists, it, I don't know, how well you can see that, but it yeah. tells you whether you can identify it using a hand lens or a microscope, or it's got a picture of an eye. If it's one that you can, that's quite distinctive and you can do with the, the naked eye. Um, so it's really useful for letting you know how difficult something is to ID. So I really like that feature about it. Mm -hmm. um, right, okay, we've got, Open. We've got we've got questions flying in now. So, Steph M, you've got a question there. Do you want to ask it, or do you want me to read it out? Oh, I've got the chat open now. Okay, so, okay. Steph's question, just for the recording, it says, "How does a nursery web spider catch its prey? Does it use its nursery web?" Um, no. So, the nursery web is. A nursery basically. Um, they're very fast spiders, they just run around and they catch their prey that way basically. Um, oh, I'm trying to keep David Maddy, would you like to ask your question? Yes, Kieran. Um, one of my main roles around the house is to catch spiders and to put them out into the garden. Am <laughs> I cool in doing that? Um, no, not really. I get that some people don't like them, but the spiders generally do make their way back in, so it might be a bit of a waste of time for you. I thought so. It depends what spiders they are as well. Sometimes, you know, some of them aren't meant to be inside, but the house spiders, if you put them out, they'll probably come back in again. So. Thank you. No worry. Uh, yeah, I suppose it's called a house spider for a reason. <laughs> um, Bob Bellamy, do you want to ask your question? It certainly. Um, I just wondered how long spiders typically live for. Uh, we've got a few residents in the cottage. and uh, Quite a few years. Um, I think house spider, I haven't looked this up for a while, but maybe about five years a house spider could live for mm. because they're protected and inside and they've got quite a nice habitat there. Um, but then generally the other spiders outside they tend to live for a year or so you know they'll get to adulthood lay eggs etc and then that'll be it or the female eats them or you know some other things or the spiderlings eat the adults and there's all sorts going on but yeah about a year i'd say um Bruce, thank you we've got a question from gabrielle yeah um I'm just wondering if there are any um, species that are listed under the NERC Act or the Wildlife and Countryside Act that ecologists should be sort of looking out for, ones that you will commonly come across, say, in the field? Um, so I don't know if there's necessarily protected spiders that you'd come across in the field that regularly. Um, there were the raft spiders that I mentioned before. There's um, one of the rare species there. There's also the ladybird spider, which I know we've got Caroline on uh, from the ladybird spider project. Um, so that's protected. That's only found in uh, one or two sites though, I think. Um, but again, if you, that wild guide to spiders, that book's really good. It will show you there alongside all the other information it says, you know, rare, scatter distribution, widespread, etc. cetera. Um, so it's quite good to look up those. Cool, thank you. No worries. I'm trying to read these ones. Caroline, do you want to add anything about the ladybird spider? Tell everybody how great it is. <laughs> yeah, but everybody knows that it's really great. I don't need to tell anybody that. Um, no, I, I'm happy to take questions, but um, probably better to wait when Holly's finished. But uh, in terms of the rarer spiders, you are quite unlikely to come across those. And you won't come across ladybird spider because the populations are pretty restricted in Dorset. 
and the numbers are quite low so yeah um right i've, I've got thought... a question from glenn yeah i just saw in there yes yeah, so about the zebra spider so glenn's asked you mentioned the zebra jumping spider can be easily id'd in the field but aren't there two other very similar species so we were talking about this the other day i'm hoping kieran can now show his book as well to show the other species oh, right um so according to the bas on the spider recording scheme website you can identify them with a photo so i'm um, based my presentation on that but i know there are a couple of others that are. it's just in the lawrence b book yeah uh, it does say that you need microscopic examination yeah, yeah. and then there's... it's just to warn people that it's not quite straightforward yeah no i don't think anything is quite straightforward no not with spiders no <laughs> but um kieran have you got the picture of the other one i can't find you where you are now there's another one that's a lot bigger than the zebra spider oh, right? oh, yes there we go. Singularis. No, yeah, and then the Zebranius as well there. Uh, so they are quite similar. There is another jumping spider though that is quite distinctive for those that live in the in the southeast, and it's called Marpissa mucosa it's the fence post jumping spider and in the last session i brought this up and holly holly's never seen it because you don't get it where she she lives i'm in midway uh, so we don't get the exciting there. it's like double the size of the of the zebra jumping spider so it's, it's and it likes to sit on the top of like fence posts so it's quite easy to find as well that's fairly distinctive you need a hand lens to have a look at it properly but yeah any more yeah. questions Finland. Oh, Karis, do you want to unmute yourself, Karis? Oh, please read. Oh, right. Okay. So Karis is asking, any way of encouraging more diversity of spiders in the garden? Um, she's in South East London and has seen one wasp female spider before. Oh, nice. Um, well, to encourage more spiders, I guess you just need more invertebrates in general. So. I guess flowers, etc., that are good for pollinators, because when you start attracting those, you're going to have the spiders that try and eat them then as well. Um, also, the standard sort of uh, log piles as well, that creates different habitats for them to live in. Um, yeah, all the standard stuff to sort of attract more invertebrates, really. Yeah, so it's go for as many micro habitats as possible, basically. Yeah, I've heard as well of spiders living in bee hotels and being attracted and living in the tubes in bee hotels. So, yeah, um, yeah, I haven't seen that. I've put one up recently as well. I keep having a look at it, expecting spiders will move in, but I haven't seen any yet. But I have heard that that happens. Um, there's another question there in the chat saying, "Can we send photos of British? Uh, sorry, photos to British Spider Survey, even if we don't know what they are, to help them identify." it um i think so yeah i think they will help you if you send a picture in um so there's details on the website uh, they're generally quite helpful they'll say you know look at this family or that family and encourage you in the right direction i think it's probably fair to say though that there are a lot of spiders that you will never be able to identify from a photograph as well so I yeah. would just say when you're sending it in, just be aware that the answer might be we can't tell you without the specimen. So just to just to pre-warn, some spiders are quite tricky, as Holly mentioned. Any more questions? Um, still got I've, five minutes, I've, so there's still plenty of time for questions. Yeah, I've got not so much a question, more a comment actually, Kieran. Uh, you mentioned that you can submit records to the spider recording scheme, which is perfectly correct. But I think a lot of people now use iRecord. Yeah. And I think that the spider recording scheme do actually harvest them from that particular piece of kit. And the beauty for beginners is, of course, you can see your photograph up there as well. Yeah. So I just wondered if you wanted to just mention that, that's all. 
Yeah, it's always a bit of a tricky one because I know uh, some of the spider recorders will harvest off I record and then some of them don't. So it depends yeah. on where you are as well. So it's quite hard to point people in the right direction and I don't want to say the wrong thing as well. So, no, no. Um, yeah, I think they're coming around to I record though. So hopefully it'll be, yeah. See, yeah, I just say the wrong thing though. Um, <laughs> I don't mind being a bit controversial. I record is a very useful tool for, for managing your own records. I use it personally for my own records. There's nothing wrong with you putting it on iRecord and then also sending it to the British Arachnological yeah. Society. What I, what I do with mine is I put them all on iRecord and then I will do a download every year or two with all of the records and send them so that they've got the, the same reference number that they've got on iRecord. So that should theoretically prevent duplication. Um, I think another thing to note with iRecord is if you look back five years, there was lots of groups that weren't covered then that are now, and, and those groups are going through the, the backlog. So for example, with slugs and snails, my, every now and again, I, I get old slugs and snail records of mine accepted because the Conchological Society are working through that backlog. Um, it's like Holly said, it's patchy in terms of the British Arachnological Society where the records are harvested. I believe harvestmen are harvested uh, nationally now. Um, pseudoscorpions get dealt with, but with spiders, it depends on what uh, BAS call the area organizer. So I think, are you in Cheshire, did you say, Glenn? Yeah, I am actually. And yeah. um, I've recently taken on the county recorder's uh, role for harvestmen. Okay. And um, I do harvest the harvestmen from uh, iRecord. Um, I wasn't doing it to say that you should send it to iRecord, yeah. your thing. It's just that many people, especially for beginners, may be concentrating on other groups. And sometimes it gets really complex who you send records to for what yeah. species. Whereas yeah. iRecord is a useful, if you like, one-stop shop. Yeah. And yeah. It, can it can prevent people from not uh, recording in the first place because they think, oh, it's another contact. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get that, definitely. I think the most important thing is to get it recorded somewhere because, yeah. do you know what, if you, even if you didn't send over your data to BAS for 10 years, if you did it in 10 years' time, they're getting all that data still. So there's... I'm a big fan of iRecord. I use it for work, I use it for my volunteer work, and I use it personally for recording as well. And I know that some recording schemes don't like aspects of it, but I'm a, I'm personally a big advocate for it. But as Holly's mentioned, in terms of uh, spiders, it is patchy as to whether it would get to BAS, depending on where it is. But in a few years' time, that might completely change for that area. So. Yeah. One, one other thing to note about iRecord is that regardless of whether the records have been verified, uh, record centres can access those records as well and they can put the records to good use uh, locally in, in local planning decisions. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a good place to put your records e even if they're not harvested by the, um, the schemes and societies. It's a a one-stop shop exactly like you say. Mm -hmm. Right, um, as I said, I just wanted to bring that to people's attention. Yeah, no, thank you. Oh. I think the next one is from David Maddy. Yeah, sorry, Did... Kieran was talking, but I think he's muted. Oh, yes, he is. I was just asking if there's any questions. I'll just um, utter my question then. Uh, do the spiders require water or do they obtain it from their prey? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I think they get some from their prey, yeah. I don't know, to be honest with you. I've never seen one take a drink. Um, so I see you mostly from prey. Um, again, though, I know house spiders, I was talking about how long they can survive for. I know they can go for months without food and water as well. So I guess they don't need to, if they do drink, they don't need to do it all that regularly. Um, but I'm not quite sure on that one, I'm afraid. Okay, thanks. 
Um, there's just a comment from, uh, is it from Stephanie? Um, saying that there is a great uh, Facebook group if people want help as well, called British yeah. Spider Identification Group. There are actually a number of Spider ID groups on Facebook, so it's well worth joining up to them. I know that they've been really helpful to me when I've submitted pictures of spiders, because I know very little about spiders, spider ID. And yeah, they're, they're a friendly bunch. So yeah, I, and there's just another mention that in Wales, they've got cough nod. Uh, the, I think that might even link into Arico, but I might be wrong. Oh yeah, yeah, so we have the Alert Wales app, which is like iRecord basically. Um, yeah. But yeah, go straight to them. Okay, just to let everybody know as well, I've dropped in a link there for our feedback form. Um, what we're going to ask is, please, please fill it in. Let us know if there are any technical issues. Um, let us know what you liked, what you didn't like. Uh, it's been a pleasure having everybody. It's great to see, there's a lot of names here that I've seen on social media, but I've never met them before. So it's nice to meet people as well. Um, we'll be hopefully doing another one of these same time next week. Again, we'll be releasing um, details of that through our newsletter. On my end, I haven't seen a lot in terms of technical issues. So if everybody reports that, that it worked fairly well, we might even increase the numbers so that we can let more people join in because it keeps filling up far too quickly. Um, so yeah, please do fill in the feedback form. Otherwise there'll be 400 people here next time you come in. It'll be even worse if, if there was any technical issues. So yeah, we'll send you all an email afterwards with a link to that feedback form. And then when we've had a play around with the recordings and decided whether we're going to use this one or the one from the previous session, we'll uh, send you another email with linking to where that is online and any extra bits of information or links that we have. But I think um, I think that's probably it from us. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Holly for a fantastic talk. So thank you very much, Holly. Uh, and I think if everybody just unmutes himself and we all say goodbye, and then we'll we'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Bye. 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 Bye.